morning. It's good to see all of you today. Thank you for being here as we begin this new series, Love Like That. It's a book written by Les Parrott, and um, it's, it's a good book. It really is, and it's got a work-study book and all kinds of stuff, but uh, we're excited. We're just going to be bringing the principles of the book uh, through Scripture to apply to your life, to my life, and to our online community. We welcome you as well. Hope you're all doing great and uh, taking care of yourselves, and um, we are mindful, as Kyle said, the many who... Um, right now who are in struggle mode, and we want to remember them in our prayers as well. And you may be here today with a special prayer need, and um, boy, you just write that down, make it known. We pray for you weekly, and uh, we want you to know that. Um, and we celebrate with Kyle Gatlin, because he, he uh, has another grandchild, and uh, Sterling and Amy had a second grandchild, and we're so excited for them and, and, uh, and for Kyle so, uh, and Deandra. So God bless y'all very, very much. And um, so we're into a series called Love Like That. Let's pray. God, speak into these moments how you've come to us in worship. Come now in your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love that song on the Holy Spirit. Man, I was really captivated by that. It just That was beautiful. I know they'll do it again, but what a beautiful song um, to just invite the Holy Spirit in, in this place. And when he rests on us, it's, um, it's not like just so that you can feel comfortable, but more also he empowers you. So um, I just love that very, very much. Now, I was watching, I can't remember which uh, news station because I don't watch that many. I only watch one or two. And I really try to get the local news. And then on occasion, I'll, I'll try to get the world news. And um, so I, I tend to watch just a couple of, of uh, things about the news. And I, I caught one on one of the big cable networks. That said, uh, that reported um, uh, one one new thing about millennials. Now, if you, some of you, if you're old enough, you may not be old enough, but if you're old enough, do you remember romance was such a great part of your dating relationship before you got married, and then you got married? Do you remember? You don't have to raise your hand, but I, I just want you to to long for that. Would you? Do you remember that? And, uh, and so it was romantic, and we always define things as romantic, and maybe some were more romantic than others, and you don't need to worry about all that, but, but kind of romance was the thing, you know, and then, then one day, you know, you'd get married, and, um, and then you discovered romance was no longer the thing. Anyway, that was a joke. Okay, but uh, uh, researchers have been uh, uh, doing a lot of work on the millennials, and the millennials are not the younger 20s, they're like the older 20s, and the younger and the mid-30s, and so that's the millennials. Then you've got a group younger than the millennials, but there's a ton of millennials. And uh, so they've been uh, doing a lot of research, this particular company, and I'm only going to tell you one question. They asked uh, this, you know, they were asking about relationships, and this is what they found out with the millennials that they interviewed. This isn't all millennials, but in their research, they discovered 68% of millennials, late 20s, <clears throat> to early 30s, uh, millennials uh, now say, 68% uh, of them now say that it's not romance that's top priority, it is financial stability. That is awesome, isn't that great? I mean, you taught them well, parents. <clears throat> you taught them well. I just want a man with a job. I want a woman who's got, you know, but, um, but, the, but the idea is actually, it's a great idea, you know. I mean, not that you don't have love and all that, but this idea of um, financial stability. And uh, whatever that means, and I'm sure that'll come out later, what all of that research indicates and what it means. But I found that to be very, very fascinating. Um, and, you know, in one season of life many years ago, it might have been romance was the top thing as you were dating to prepare, you know, and how much fun it was to have romantic, you know, times and dinners and all kinds of things. And then now it's, you got a job? You, you got a job? Yeah, you don't have a job? Okay, well, call me. Call me when you have one. All right. And, uh, and then when you have one, I want to see, you know, your portfolio. Okay. So anyway, you've taught, you've taught your kids or grandkids very, very well. I want to begin by asking you this question. And just, you can answer it in your heart or you can just think about it. Do you want to love like Jesus? Now think about it. <clears throat> or you already have answered in your heart. But do you want to love like Jesus? That is a much bigger question than the way I just threw it out there. It is a huge question for your life and mine. Do you want to love like Jesus? Because I always encourage you to remember that Jesus is the best life. And that when you and I have Jesus within us, it is the best life possible. 
Everything else is secondary to Jesus. And, and, um, and I want you to know that. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's what God revealed in the gift of Jesus. But I want you to really think about this question. Do you want to love like Jesus? Do you want to love like him? Now, the truth of the matter, or if we really want the truth to be known, it is so tempting in our lives to use God, but not love him. I want you to catch that. It is very, very tempting for us to use God, but not love him. When we, some of us here, we are online, we want Jesus to be our errand boy. We do, we want Jesus to be our errand boy and not the savior of the world, not, not Lord of my life. I, I don't want all that. I, I just want Jesus to, hey Jesus, go get me that house. Hey Jesus, go get me that car. Hey Jesus, go. And all of a sudden you've turned Jesus into an errand boy rather than savior and Lord of us all. And when that happens, folks, you don't love like Jesus, and I don't love like Jesus. And what's interesting is, in a relationship, if, if, you, if you haven't noticed, if, if in a relationship that you maybe have, your marriage, or dating, or whatever it could be, coworkers, uh, wh- whatever, in a relationship, there's always this natural tendency to gravitate toward, uh, or actually look for solutions for relationship challenges. I want you to think about that. There, there's, this, there's this natural desire or to gravitate, if you will, to find a solution with our relationship challenges. So when we go through a challenge in our relationships, whatever it might be, you know, we really want to get it right. And so we, we naturally just gravitate toward, how do I get a solution? Let me tell you, if, if we brought in like one of the top speakers in the country on marriage, and we brought that we couldn't even fit it in here. We would have to do it downtown or wherever. And it would just be packed out with people there wanting to either, you know, work on their marriage, make it stronger, or others would want to come because they're dating and they just want to kind of check things out. But so many people would go because they, we gravitate towards solutions to relationship challenges. Like, for example, um, you know, God, I, I just want you to, fix my wife. If you could just fix her, God. I I didn't mean mine, I meant yours. And um, God, if you could just fix my kids, or God, if you could just fix, you know, my, this coworker, or, or God, if you could just, you know, you have to pray this a lot, you know, extend some extra grace to so-and-so, and you know what I'm talking about, and you, and you pray for that person, or, you know, you pray for uh, uh, the serial dater in your life, and you know, God, teach them to slow down, or you know what I mean, and so on and on it goes. The actual theme of the Bible is love. Now, I know we could argue over particular passages and say, well, that one doesn't sound like love. I I know we could argue that. I know that. But I'm going to tell you that when you read Scripture and you read the overall story, the overall theme is love. I mean, it is. It is the self-giving love of God for God's people and for, for all of us. And Jesus demonstrated love. So if you, if you have confusion in the Bible, my encouragement for folks is always to go to the Gospels first. I know the Old Testament, and I know that it can be up and down for you, or for, but um, I, I'll tell you right now, I, I see love all in the Old Testament, all over the Old Testament. But, but you know what I encourage people to do is always go to the Gospels and read the, the experience of Jesus. Because then you're going to find that Jesus loved and he was, he was just the, the, you know, the overwhelming, he demonstrated the, the overwhelming sense of love. And then he invited you and me to follow. That's why I asked you at the beginning, do you want to love like Jesus? Because that's actually the invitation today. You know, we're going to talk about some excellent secrets and, cha- and, and, some, and opportunities to grow in our relationships with people over the next five Sundays. Today, we're talking about our relationship with Jesus because we've got to get this right. And if we don't get this right, and if you don't try not to shut or close out on me, even if that's not where you are right now, I just hope you'll hear and see what you think about this, okay? Because first and foremost, you are going to be invited, and I'm going to be invited to love like Jesus. And then when we do, we're supposed to 
follow, live it out. Love like that. You see how, you see how Jesus demonstrated love? You're supposed to love like that. I'm supposed to love like that. And that becomes real, real important to us. Okay, I want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, <clears throat> we have a few scriptures today that I want you to take note of, okay? This is a great one from the Apostle Paul. He is in prison in Rome. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. And you've got to remember, there's a lot of things going on in Ephesus. It's, a, it's huge. It's a massive city, 250,000 people. And it's, and it's just wrapped up in all kinds of worship. But here's what happened. Paul went there and stayed there a good while, and people were converted. And there were Jews who were giving their lives to Christ, and there were Gentiles giving their lives to Christ. Now, the reason why I tell you that is because after Paul leaves, and then he's later put in prison in Rome, he finds out that the church at Ephesus, the Jewish Christians don't want anything to do with the Gentile Christians. It's like the Auburn Christians not wanting to have anything to do with the Alabama Christians. But it's, you know what I mean? And so, but in all honesty, the Jewish Christians didn't want to mess around with the Gentiles. I didn't want them anywhere, you know. And so there was a lot of tension going on. And Paul has to write them and tell them, hey, you're not looking at the right person. You're not looking at the right life. And so this is what he says in Ephesians. Now, this is from the message. So it's a little bit different, uh, has a little bit different slant, but it's really good. All right, so this is what Paul says. Watch what God does. Immediately, I want you to remember that word. Watch what God does, and then do it. And then do it. Like, I love this, like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Let's take a minute. Let's just soak that in for a minute, can we? Can we just take that and soak it in, parents? Can you? I know some of you are sitting here going, absolutely, I am the perfect parent. You're the one I'm talking to. You're the one I want to talk to. Paul says, like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. I'll, I'll come back. All right. Mostly what God does is love you. Isn't that an awesome line? Most of what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. Here's our focal point, okay? Here's the focus. Christ loved us. His love was not cautious. It was extravagant. Extravagant. Beyond what you could ever measure. He didn't love in order to get something from us but to give everything of himself to us. And then here it is, love like that. Love like Jesus. And so here it is, summed up for us right there. And, and so he says, hey, you, I mean, it's a really key thing that he says, you really, you really want to get this? You really, and he's talking to those Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, but he's saying it to us right here in Dothan, Alabama and online. He's saying this, directly to us. He's looking us in the eye and he is saying to us, hey, you want a relationship with me? You want something that could be the best of your life? Follow me. Follow me. And this is what Paul, this, Jesus says that, but Paul is saying exactly what Jesus said. Paul is now saying in this writing, look at Jesus, see him as the example, follow him. And then the question becomes for all of us, well, how do, how, how do I begin? You know, how, how do I begin? And it's a very important question for us. How, how do I do it? And you know, for a lot, for, for many of us, you know, when we hear follow Jesus, that's good. When we think about relationships, that's good. But you know, it always boils down to how. It does. It always comes back to how do I begin? And Paul Paul told us, follow God's example. Look at the life of Jesus that he lived on this earth. Watch what God does and then do it. So how do you begin to love like that? 
You look at the life of Jesus, and that's in the Gospels, and that's in worship, and that's in prayer and praise to God. I mean, are you catching what he said? The how, folks, how do you do this? It's by watching Jesus. It's by looking at Jesus. And you look at him through his word. And then you discover who he is. But we all have a problem. We live in a culture where you can't watch very long, right? I mean, we live in a crazy culture. And we live in a culture where, you know, you really... You know, if, if you look at somebody too long, they're like, uh, is there a problem? And I understand there's a lot of creepy people out there. I know. I know. I know about your in-laws. And I, no, I'm joking. Your in-laws are fantastic. I was joking. If they're here today, we're so glad you're here. And I was just joking. All right. <clears throat> but it, it you know, but really seriously, you know, nowadays we're kind of creepy if we, you know, I, I, when I'm flying out to Houston or whatever, I'll get, you know, I'm in the airport and usually there's, you know, a wait time or a layover or whatever. And, you know, I love to watch people. Now, I don't, like, you know, doom, 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 you know, walk wherever they go. I don't do any of that. I just sit, you know, with a cup of coffee or something, and I just watch and see who's in a hurry, who's mad, who's happy. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just an interesting experience. But if I got up and started following these people and looking at them, you know, I would be arrested for stalking, right? I'd get arrested because, you know, we're no, that's not kind of, a good thing anymore. But I'm telling you right now, when it comes to the life of Jesus, it's a good thing to watch him. And that's what Paul says, watch him and then do it. That's what he says to you and to me. I know as you've looked at scripture, sometimes it's easy to overlook this, but I hope you'll catch it right now. In, In scripture, you need to notice how often Jesus looked intently at another person before he brought about the miracle. It's really interesting. He would, he would look at them intently, and then he would bring the miracle. I hope, I hope you'll pay attention to that as, as we read the word over these next few weeks together, okay? Like, for example, John chapter 1, verse 42. And so <clears throat> there's, uh, there's this person that needs help, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus, and of course, the person who needs help needs help is Peter. So Andrew is bringing his brother to Jesus. Okay, this uh, this is right before he's given his life to Christ to follow. And so Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, said, "You are Simon, son of John, but you will now be called Cephas, which means Peter. You know, you will be you will be given a new name. You will be given a a whole new way of looking at life." And so when he says, look at him, you know, he looked at him, Jesus looked at him, that means he looked at him intently. That means to look beyond the present. It means to look beyond the surface. And what Jesus did was, he said, Peter, there is so much more for, for your future. And I want you to know that's what Jesus is doing for you. Before you start relationships, of course, I know we've already started our relationships, But I want you to know right now, it's not too late for any of us to look at this relationship and understand that that's what Jesus wants for you and me. He looks at us intently, and he says, do you know the possibilities of your future, of what I have for you, and what you can be? And so as Jesus looked at Peter, you see that in the scripture, it wasn't about, Peter, we're just changing your name, relax. That's not what it was about at all. It was about Peter, here is what life can be. And that's really what God's doing for you and me. And when we go into a relationship, it would be so good to have that already within us. As we get married, as we date, as whatever, as you, you know, work in your career, it would be so good to have this as the priority first, that you know what? I have been given the name of Jesus. I am his child. And I will live it out. I will live it out in the way that he wants my life to be. Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now, would remind people again and again and again that they they have eyes and he wants them to focus. He wants them to focus on him. How many times, if you could just look it up, I mean, how many times did Peter and, and Paul and all the disciples look, you know, kind of look at the situation first, before they looked at Jesus for the miracle. 
How many times do you and I look at the situation and not Jesus before we face what, you know, we're just so busy in my life, your life, focusing on the circumstance rather than Jesus who says, I have your future. Put your eyes on me. Imitate me. I mean, it's just a powerful thing. In Acts chapter 3, I want you to see this in verses uh, 4, uh, four, 5, and 6. Now, there was a man who came up, and, and, uh, and, and it was to Peter and, and to John, and, and this, this man was broken, I mean, and, and didn't have anything, and he was just begging for help. And, uh, and so this is what happens. Peter looked straight at him. Did y'all get it? He looked intently at him, as did John. And then Peter said, hey, look at us. Hey, you know, he might have been begging for help, crying to the ground, keeping his eyes on his circumstance, on what he's going through, the pain, whatever it might be in his life. And it was a lot of junk and a lot of misery. And so he's just looking at that. And Peter and John catch him off guard and they say, hey, look at us. And he's begging for help. And here's what happens. So the man gave them his attention. Wouldn't you? Somebody go, hey. Of course, I know if you're in New York and you walk by, we would keep going, right? Right, okay. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So, you know, maybe he's going to get, is it an attitude or, you know, we don't know. He's expecting something. And then Peter said, and y'all know the classic line, silver or gold I do not have. I'd have just walked away, you know, I'd have just crawled away, forget you, but that's not what he did. Silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he said, walk. In the name of Jesus, walk. And he got up and he walked and he danced. And he, I mean, it, it, he was so excited about his life. He was dancing and praising God. And this is, this is something I want you to understand uh, about what, what we're learning. And that is, when they say, look at us, you know, it's like, hey, remember, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And then live it out. Live it out. You know what it means? In, in Greek, it means to imitate. To follow means to imitate. That's what it means. It's the word mimic. In, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, uh, the, in the first century, if the word mimic was used, it meant to imitate, to follow, to basically watch and then do. And that was, the, that was the idea, that was the reality. And I know you're thinking, well, what does this have to do with relationships? It has everything to do with relationships because this is the thing you gotta get right first. Most of us tend to watch people and then, like I said, then we, when we need Jesus, we call our errand boy, help us now. And that is not the way Jesus works. And that is not the way Jesus wants to work in your relationships. He wants you to mimic him. That means follow him. When you get a chance, you can read this, but uh, in Ephesians 5, you, you saw the comment that Paul made about uh, parenting. And in chapter 6, you will also find something in Ephesians about parenting. And uh, Paul gives an illustration in chapter 5 that we looked at about parents and children. And I want you to hear me one more time, parents. This is important. One of the goals of parenting according to Scripture, one of the goals according to Scripture as you parent is having your children, get ready, behave in the same way you behave. Take your time. I'm not going to ask you how you're doing. I'm not going to... I want you to hear that, though. That is... That is scripture. That's back in Deuteronomy. That's over here now that we find in Ephesians. But the basic premise is this. Families, that's all of us. That includes me. The goal of parenting in, in scripture is having your children behave in the same way that you behave. So that might explain a few things. With us or our kids or our grandkids. So if you're not behaving right, if you're not, well, we all know the reason. It's your spouse's fault. We all know it. We all know it's the next door neighbor's kids. They're horrible. We all know it's those crazy cousins. Whenever they come over, our kids go nuts, right? What do you do? 
<laughs> you know, what do your children see when we're at home? What, 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 what do the children see? I was thinking about this. What do they see? I think they see something like this. In this corner, in this corner, are you ready to rumble? In this corner, weighing 133 pounds. She goes by mom, but we call her she-devil at the house. And over in this corner is dad, weighing 225 pounds. He's a little overweight because he handles a lot of beverages in one hand. I think y'all know what I'm talking about. And it goes on and on from there. You know, the reality is, you want to know God? You want God to work in your life? I mean, really? Do you want him to work in, in your life? Do you want him to really work in your life? He wants to work in your life. He wants to work in my life. There's no doubt about it. And I want you to remember this. When, when he does this, when he works in your life, it may be different than the person that you're dating or the person that you marry. Did you catch that? It may be different than the person you marry. Or what, what I mean is, is how God works, and you've got to know that. You've got to know that. That's with your friendships. You know, it, you know, the teenagers here, that's with your friendships. You may not be identical. Matter of fact, we really don't want you to be. But God does want to work in you and in me. There, there's one more I want you to see, John 21, as we look at the word. John 21. Now, John 21 is where Jesus now, it's, it's the end of the book of John, and Jesus is, you know, this is post-resurrection, and, uh, you know, he's seen the disciples now down at the water at the Sea of Galilee, and it's a powerful moment. And uh, so Jesus is talking to them about, you know, life and, you know, all these kinds of things. And, and watch what Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. So, you know, Jesus was already talking about some things that were going on, and, uh, and, he, and he was telling Peter about, I mean, he might not have known it, but Peter, this is how the way you will, you will die. Then he said to Peter, follow me. Imitate me. Mimic me. Okay? So here's the challenge. All right? Peter turned, and this is one of my favorite parts. Peter turned. That means he turned back, you know, around and he saw, that, he saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? I love you. I'm so glad y'all know that. And uh, saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, who wrote John? Yeah, there you go. All right. So just insert your name. How's that? No. So he saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. So Peter now is aware John is following us in this intimate time they have together. Watch, what's, watch what happens. This was the one, here we go, John's identifying. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper, at the Lord's supper. So this is John, and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? So John, you know, I'm just letting you know, John's right there in the midst of all that. So he wants you to know, I was there in that conversation with Peter. I was there. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Now, when you first read that, you're probably thinking something sweet and beautiful and, and all of that. But watch what Jesus says. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you, Peter? Wow. If, if I want him to be alive as long as I want him to be alive, Peter, what deal is that to you? You must follow me. So it may be different, Peter, for you, and it may be different for John. And by the way, it was. Peter, you know, he was crucified upside down. John lived in exile, probably into his 80s. What I'm saying is they loved Jesus. They followed Jesus, but their experiences were so different. And I think, you know, you need to know that, and I need to know that because... God's going to work in your life, but it may be different than your spouse, or it may be different than a friend, or it doesn't mean God doesn't work. I mean, he's working, but it may be different. You need to remember that, okay? That's real important if you want to have a meaningful relationship. All right, real quick, I want to show you, that, just, just so you understand how God works differently. All right, so <clears throat> Moses, 
you know, he had to stand before Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. Do you remember the very first miracle that Moses then provided? He turned water in the Nile River to what? Blood. I'm glad you got it. Good. I was so afraid somebody was going to say some wine. No, 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 no. Wrong story. Wrong story. So that's Moses. And then you get to the time of Jesus. He's at a wedding. It's his very first miracle. And what does he do? He turns water into wine. Okay. So get this. Two incredible people of God. Incredible. And yet, even miracles were different. And the reason I'm telling you that is just so you know that there may be a season that you go through where the other person, maybe everything's going fine and everything in your life isn't. And I call that the Moses season. And I'm not down on Moses, but I call it the Moses season. It, it's kind of like, you know, that season of your life where things are just kind of not good. It's not working in your relationship right now. And it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth kind of time. And, you know, you bought this, honey, so I'm going to spend money on that. And, and you, you said this, so I'm going to say that. And, and you aren't pleasing me. I'm not going to please you. And you don't respect me, so I'm not going to respect you. And it just leads to the Moses season. That's where you are. And it's called a bloody mess. Anybody get it? Now, River? Okay, remember. A bloody mess. And see, sometimes that's what happens. And that's why I'm talking to you about living and loving like Jesus. It may be different. It may be different, but follow him. Follow him. If you allow Jesus to be the author of your soul, to be in charge of your heart. He's going to lead you to a better way. But this is first. And a lot of times our mistake is, this is not first in our journey. We, we don't get this dealt with. We don't get this dealt with. And so, I mean, it, it's something that you and I have to consider if we're going to really live freely. Too many of us, we carry a grudge against someone. And what Jesus has said is this, watch me, which means if you watch me, you're going to see that I forgave everyone. So you go and you forgive other people so that you can be free. You're carrying bitterness, whatever it might be. No, no, Jesus says, no, you let that go because I have let it go through the cross. I think one of the most beautiful things that you could do, that I could do, is look at the person we love through the cross. It changes, it changes how we relate. If we could look at them through the lens of the cross. And maybe you do have a relationship problem. Maybe it's with a friend. Maybe it's with a coworker. Maybe whatever, a dating or even marriage. The point is, have you given your heart to Jesus? No, no, are you following him? Are you watching him and living like that and loving like that? That's the question. I will tell you this. There is no way that you can be right with your mate until you get right with your maker. Are you right with the Lord? Well, let me tell you real quick, real quick. When you don't live like Jesus, when you don't love like that, when you don't, it's usually because, like I said, we're not looking at him, we're not watching him, we're watching our lives, our circumstances, what we want, and we've turned him into an errand boy, okay? And so what I want you to think about is this, when we don't love like Jesus, when we don't live like that, some of us, what happens is, we, we begin to convince ourselves because we now have focused on, like, if I just find the right person, if I just find the right person, if I just find the right person, then my life will be right. I mean, good luck with that. I've never met the right person. I haven't. I, I, I really, I haven't. I, and I certainly know I'm not. But I, I have discovered this. We're all broken. And usually when a broken person starts dating a broken person, then you have two broken people. And when they get married, they got lots of broken stuff. It doesn't mean it's bad. It means we've got to begin to understand, are we going to watch Jesus? Are we going to get that right? Are we going to live for him? And we're going to live it out. 
or are we going to say, you're the answer to all my problems? And then you expect that person to fill the void of the emptiness that only Jesus can fill. And Jesus said basically in Matthew 7, what you need to do is you got to take up a cross and you got to follow me. And that was not easy. That was very, that was not a light. You know how you and I, we hear that and we go, okay, I want you to know it was tough. And people are going, What? But here it is. I want to show you right now, when you, when you don't love like Jesus because your focus is on your circumstances, you have convinced yourself that there is someone other than Jesus that, who can set you free. Let me just tell you real quickly some of the things that can happen to you in your relationship. Here's number one. When you don't love like Jesus in your relationship, ready? Jump, we jump too quickly into another relationship, or we jump to another, or we jump into the first one. We're jumping quickly. I, I love when you know, couples are starry-eyed. I, I want you to be starry-eyed. I, I think it's great. I love it when couples are starry-eyed, you know, and they've, they've been dating eight weeks, and then they'll call in or something like that and say, um, you know, we'd like to maybe schedule a wedding. And I'm like, I usually say, I'm not available for eight more years. So if, if, you, if you could work on your relationship for eight, we will get you married. And, uh, and I, I've never done that, but I thought it. And, um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like, we'd like to do that. And so I usually, if I meet with them, I say, well, let's meet or something like that. You know, this was years ago. And, uh, and I would always ask them, well, what does death do us part mean? And, you know, and they would, they would always say, well, it means, you know, you're going to die, but we'll love each other forever and da 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 And, and I go, I said, that's good. I said, let me tell you what I think it means, death do us part. I said, I think it means dirty dishes. Did y'all get that? I think it means dirty dishes. I, I, I tell them, I think it means overdrafts. I, I think it means uh, communication glitches. I, I think it means career struggles. I think it means mortgage payments, actually some that weren't paid. I, I think, you know, it means uh, stomach issues. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I think it means fighting over ESPN or watching The Bachelor. I think it means your hairline recedes and your waistline expands. And we haven't even begun to talk about travel ball. I'm not against it. I'm just putting it in the socialization conversation. We jump so quickly. Huh, huh, huh. We're going to love. We're going we're gonna to feel loved. Here's the next one. Lack of maturity factor. What I want to encourage you today is go home today with your beautiful two-year-old and take out the steak knives at your house, put them down on the ground, and say, have fun. Now, that's terrible, I know, and don't you dare do that. Don't you dare. No, Hayes, two-year-old, not, not, no, mature, no, not mature enough. All right, well, then get your eight-year-old, give him the keys of the car, and let him drive down the street of your neighborhood. Some of you have done that, and shame on you. No, they're not mature enough. They're, they're not ready for that. They're, they're not. If you ever have time and you read Matthew chapter 5, which is the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about blessed are you with this and blessed are you with that. And what he was talking about is how to grow. And what he really meant was this, and I want you to remember this. When he used the word blessed, it means near the heart of God. That's what it really means. To be near the heart of God are you when you struggle. To be near the heart of God are you when you struggle, when you're suffering. To be near the heart of God are you when you have been accused of something and it's not true. Near the heart of God are you again and again and again. And the idea behind it is, hey, what God has in mind is to grow you and to grow me. Do you remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler walked up to Jesus and said, you know, he had a good life, y'all. He had a very, very good life. And he walked up to Jesus and he said, what do I need to do to get saved? He's just checking it off. You remember? And Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what, do you know the Ten Commandments? And he said, man, I know all ten. I've, got, I know, I've known them since I was a kid. And Jesus knew he wasn't telling the truth. So Jesus looked at him intently and he said, well, give all that away and come follow me. 
And of course he left. It was too much, too much. You do remember that the disciples spent three years with Jesus to mature and grow, and they still didn't get it until Jesus resurrected, and then they were empowered with the Holy Spirit. You know, part of the, uh, the stuff that I've been seeing and watching for years, research indicates that, uh, and this doesn't have to be true, it doesn't, and it's not true for a lot of you, but um, it, it said that, you know, um, research indicates that it's best if, if you could be about 25 years of age before you get married, about 25, and then um, uh, particularly they say for men, and they said for men it's best if they're at least 25 years of age, and you know why, I know the ladies do, it's because they said their brain doesn't even begin to develop until about age 25. That's the truth. I mean, it's a true, it was a true research study. And, uh, and women, you're, you develop much younger, and, uh, and that could be good or bad, depending on you ladies. But, but still, it's an interesting thing, a part of this. Now listen, is a lack of maturity. And man, do we make some messed up choices. Here's the third thing, real quick, insecurity. So often when we don't live like Jesus, we are so insecure. And I can't tell you how many people through the years have said these words. I just want to be with someone. Even if they don't love me, I just want to be with someone. That is not a healthy statement. That is insecurity everywhere. The final thing is this, unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. This comes when you don't love or don't follow Jesus, don't love Jesus like that. I mean, it really does. Um, don't raise your hand, but have you ever thought in your lifetime that the relationship that you are in or have been in or whatever, um, those of you who have been married a long time, I mean, a relationship, have you ever learned this? A relationship doesn't answer all your problems. It only increases them. I thought that was good. Have you noticed it? I've learned that some people get married because they're lonely. And the very same people get divorced because they're lonely. Okay, maybe not as good as I thought. And we're always trying to fill the void, always, because we won't watch Jesus and then follow him. We won't watch him and we won't follow him. And that is our torment. So let me let you in on the secret, okay, and we'll go. The devil will wait. Now listen to me. The devil will wait until you're run down to bring you temptation that promises relief. But it's not true. And so the heart of the matter is, let the perfect love of Jesus come into your imperfect life. Let him in. And then follow him. and follow him. Let's pray. God, I ask right now that you would open our hearts to the invitation to be loved by Jesus. And if there's anyone here online or in, present here in worship, I just ask right now if there's anyone online who needs to allow the perfect love of Jesus to enter their life, that they would do it right now. Lord Jesus, just come into my life. Forgive me, and he does. Save me, and he does. And Lord, not only do I want your perfect love in me, I want to watch and follow you. And it all begins, folks, as you read his word, as you pray and worship and praise and then your life becomes the life of Jesus and you begin to love like that. We love you, Lord. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a great time with this series, so make plans to come, invite some others, and please take care of yourself. God bless you.